God is truly indeed good. You may be seated. God is, God is good. And I know that's a word that's been watered down now, that, that, that word good. You know, we use good for some of everything. Even things that aren't good, we say, it was good. And, and, and what we really meant was it was okay, but it wasn't great. Great now has become good. And awesome has become a, a little bit better than good. But when I look in scripture and it says God is good, that means he is beneficial. That means he is that which will be of benefit and nourishment to you. When he says he is great, okay, well that means he stands above the rest. When he is awesome, he's done blown your mind. But you know, we have changed meanings of words and they don't mean that anymore. And so when we sing it, oh, taste and see, he's good. Nah, nah, he's good. He's good. Y'all know that. Good morning, Solid Word. I am glad to be here. I'm glad to be here this time with family. Amen. Now, I know they're all wondering if I'm going to have them stand. No, y'all can see them in the back. I'm going to make them stand with me in the back so that they don't have to stand now. But you can get a chance to meet them. We've had a great week this week. We've had a lot of stuff to do as we, are, as we have been able to, to get that last bit of stuff planned that we move here. I was saying to someone, um, the next time I'm here, I'm staying. Period. I'm looking forward to that. And we're kind of counting down if everything works out according to plan. Now, I know God does some things differently, but if it works out according to how we're trying to plan two months from the day, they'll be picking up our stuff and bringing it on this side of the ocean. And so we're kind of looking forward to what's going to happen after that. But I want to jump into the word of God this morning because I want us to continue to be encouraged. It's, it's, it's great to see the people laughing together. Is to see you know each other in relationship that you can say the things that you've been able to say and people can laugh comfortably with it. I think that's good. The day that we come up in church and and it's all sad faces, uh, uh, somebody's not worshiping the Lord. Because for us, even though we may have tough times, even though we may be having a bad day, week, month, maybe even year. The fact that that good God that we just sang about really exists. This is not some fairy tale. I had a chance this 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 uh, this weekend to see the case for Christ. I recommend everybody go see that. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful faith encourager. It just was. If you get a chance to see it, see it. But 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 this real God that we serve, that's not a fantasy. It's not a fable. That indeed, as we bank and we rely on that, it will be amazing what we will see God do in our lives as he changes us as we get into his word. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. I know last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, but every Sunday we meet is because of the resurrection. And so we're going to do Resurrection Sunday part two. Luke 24 Verses 13 through 35. And you can stand with me for the reading of the word. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New American Standard. And it says, and behold, <clears throat> two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? And unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the, to the sentence of death and crucified him. 
but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. <clears throat> Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of them who were with us <clears throat> went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. And they approached the village where they were going. And he acted as though he was going farther. But they urged him saying, stay with us. For it is getting late to women, sorry, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to one another, uh, uh, right, then they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us? while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us. And they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. They began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord, that that day you not only appeared to all of them, but Lord, you appeared to more later. And then, oh, Lord, you remained alive. This was not an appearance of a ghost. Father, this was not some mass hallucination. Father, you had actually raised Christ from the dead. And because of that, our hope stands strong today. Father, I pray as we get into your word, Lord, that our hope would rise. God, that our encouragement would increase, that our faith would be strengthened. And as we leave here today, Lord, we leave with our heads high, knowing, oh God, that we know you. And for those who don't know you yet, oh God, may they hear of your power, your strength, your glory, and your love and grace for them as well. Open our eyes that we may recognize you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you guys to think, go in your mind's eye and just picture for a second the last time you were really, really discouraged. Maybe even on the brink of being disillusioned. I want you to think about what got you there. I want you to think about the time in which you thought life was going to happen one way or maybe one of two ways and it happened in a completely different way. You are at a point or you were at a point at that time where you did not anticipate. You did not expect it to be where it is at that particular time and it could even be now. And that somehow even though you prayed and 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 even though you, you, you seemingly sought God, this did not happen as you thought it should. The agenda that you had set seemed to be erased, and it was another agenda in front of you. And I would say there may be some of us, if not all of us, that there have been a time like that in our lives, and it's not just man that we were discouraged by or disillusioned over. For some of us, it was God. For some of us, we go, God, I seemingly did all the right things. I said all the right things. At least I thought I did. I know we like to give ourselves a lot of grace in that area. We give a lot of leeway in that area. I know I do. 
I talk before God as if I'm gleaming, glowing like Jesus did on that Mount of Transfiguration. I live for you, Lord. And somehow life did not happen as I thought it would. And I found myself angry with God. And in my anger, what I really was saying, God, you messed up. You messed up. I would even dare say some of us may even be disillusioned with God. This thing is not what I thought it was. This this Christianity is not. I'm looking around in my world today and God, what are you doing? It's like you sitting on your hands. I'm looking at this crazy stuff in my community. Our country seems to be on the brink of war. What is happening, Lord? But you know what? There is a word from this Emmaus Road experience that I think all of us, all of us can have a part in. I want you to stay with me. It's a little warm in here today. And so we're going to sweat through the warmth. And we're going to stay awake. I can say it another way. But but, but you know what? We're going to pay attention and we're going to let God bless us. And we're going to let God speak to us in the, in the short time that we have here this morning. But I want to talk to you about truly walking with Jesus, going from disillusionment to delight. That truly walking with Jesus will take us from disillusionment to delight. And when we start off this story, I find this interesting. We know this is resurrection morning. And as we have read the different accounts, Jesus has already now been resurrected and he has actually appeared to some already. I love the fact of whom he appeared to first. Because it is it is something that amazes those who 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 try to prove or disprove, as we saw this weekend, the account of the resurrection, because you would never choose people to whom. Their testimony would never stand in a court of law to be the first people you want to see you. If you were trying to build and run a hoax, you would never do that. I would never put someone unreliable as the first one to go and tell. I would never choose the town liar. I would never choose the person who has zero street credibility. I would never choose the person who no one would believe to go and tell that they saw me be raised from the dead. And yet that's exactly what Jesus did. Because you do know that women's testimony, sorry women, that's how it was then, it's not now. But, 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 But women's testimony could not stand as legitimate in the court of law. And Jesus said, I know that, but because this thing is really happening, I'm going to let them see me first. And he does. And he sends them on their way. And we talk about that later in the story. But I love what he does. He, he breaks all norms. He already broke the norm when he chose the 12. Because most of us wouldn't have chosen them. Much less the people of that day. And so what we find is that Jesus seems to break all the norms. And now here it is on this morning. What should be the height of excitement for humanity and in human history actually is one of the most devastating and discouraging times, especially for the followers of Christ and for those who are expecting something in the nation of Israel. And so there are two things I want to cover this morning, two things, two, two, two big rocks I want us to look at. I want us to look at why they were disillusioned, and then I want to look at why it was turned into delight why they were disillusioned, and in that, why do we tend to get disillusioned? And then next, why? Or how can we turn it into delight? Let me ask you this. I ask you to picture a time of delusionment. Now I'm going to ask you to picture a time of delight in your life, a time when something actually happened, a series of events, something you received, and man, you couldn't have been any happier. You couldn't have been any more excited 
I think I'm going to change this if it keeps going. I'm going to just go ahead and use the handheld. Technical difficulties are nothing when we're listening to the word of God. Not at all. And so what I want us to realize is that morning, why they were disillusioned and what turned it into delight. Why they were disillusioned? I want you to keep that in mind all the time. And then I want you to ask yourself that question. Why do I get disillusioned? And how can I allow God to turn it into delight, into something good, into something now that my head is not down, but my head is held high? That way I'm not walking along discouraged, but I'm willing to talk about it proudly and boldly because he has changed it into delight. Well, let's look at what happened. It says that morning they were walking along and the way that scripture reads, they were debating. There were two guys who were probably in a heated discussion of what just happened all along. And here they were now. They had witnessed the life of Christ. They had witnessed his entry into Jerusalem as a king. They had, they, they had witnessed the power and they had heard the message of Jesus like no one else ever before him had done. Because they said it, that he was a prophet, mighty in deed and power. I said, he couldn't believe it. And the people were shocked. As you read the Gospels, they says, no one speaks with authority like you. And they had witnessed all that. And now he marches into Jerusalem, and they had a plan for God. See, because most of them thought their redemption and their deliverance was going to be politically based like some of us today think is going to happen that way. And our deliverance is in Christ. It is. The, our freedom of living is in Christ. Our freedom of lifestyle is in Christ. And so he says they thought he was going to do something else. And so in he comes. And boy, it seems like everything changes quickly. All of a sudden, he is grabbed and arrested. Ho, 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 hold on. We didn't expect. This is the guy that just raised a man who had been dead for days to the point where when he went to open the tomb, his sister said, you sure you won't do that? Because, you know, by now, uh, 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 he should be rotting and smelling. They said, by now he stinks, Lord. Roll it away anyway. And he calls him out and he has them unwrap his grave clothes and there stands their brother, Lazarus. This is a man who has fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. This is a man who has cured leprosy without himself being deemed unclean. Because when you touched a leper, you were unclean, but he took the unclean and made them clean. And they heard this. Some of them saw this. So when they saw him arrested in Jerusalem, they were like, what is happening? One of them on the cross said, hey, hey you, you know, why don't you do something? The crowd said, hey, he saved others. Why didn't he save himself? And everyone was like, yeah, why not? And then they saw him butchered, brutally beaten. They saw him hung and they saw him die. Some of them close enough saw the soldier test to see if he was dead and then pierced his side and watched water and blood come out. They realized, hold on a second. I dream, what? What just happened? That's what they were saying. And so this is the mind, devastated. Now I know we're talking about the death of Christ, but I'm gonna translate this to your life and those times in which you stood there and said, what? And although the devastation was at, wasn't at you seeing Christ, the Messiah, die, because they couldn't picture that in their mind's eye, but you saw something in your life die. You saw hope die. You saw what you thought was going to happen go away, and you thought, whoa, life has just turned ugly. Now, what am I going to do? And then God let that sit for three days. He didn't come to the rescue right. I know sometimes we say, God gonna come to my rescue right away. I got a sad day. God gonna make it glass. Sometimes God lets you sit there and is asking you what you gonna do now. 
He let it sit. And then after three days, of course, we know that he raises. But why were they disillusioned? That first reason why they were disillusioned was because they had an agenda that was not equal to God's. First reason. And we will too. Their agenda was he was going to ride into Jerusalem and free us from our Roman oppressors. All that power that you just showed, you should be able to stop bullets like Superman. Well, they didn't have bullets. You should be able to stop arrows. Nothing should be able to harm you. You just raised a man from the dead who was dead four days. So obviously power resides in you. Obviously you have the power of these prophets. And so now nothing's going to stop our boy. He's going to come in and change it all. And yet as we look at this and we look at our agenda, it didn't lead to where we thought it would. And some of us right now, we're mad at God because he didn't do A, B, or C. Some of us have walked away, or at least we have distanced ourselves from God because he didn't do something we thought he should. He didn't heal somebody that we thought he should. I, you know, and, and, and you guys were, some of you guys were around me when my mother passed away. And I know that for us was, was just devastating. And I remember talking to one of my brothers at that time. And I, you know, and, and, and I can share this because he shared it publicly. He, he remembers saying, my faith was almost shipwrecked. He said, because I knew God was going to heal her because I claimed it. And as we stood there over her hospital bed and watched her take her last breath, we were like, what? See, I knew God could do whatever he wanted, but I didn't know all of what he wanted to do. I didn't. And so I thought one thing, God had another plan. And at the age of 60, she went home to be with her Lord. And my brother said, I almost went home. This is what he told me. I almost went home and burned my Bible. Because he didn't do what I thought he should do. Or what I thought the word said. But you know what? We get it wrong sometimes. Because our agendas sometimes are self-centered. Our agendas are focused on our comfort. Our agendas are focused on where we want to be. And I'll never forget that day. As I walked out the room, and I've shared this with some of you guys in the past. As I walked out that room, there was a voice in my head. No, I didn't hear it audibly, but it might as well have been. And just as clear as day, I heard these words, and I still remember them today. Curtis, will you praise me even though your mom is gone? And with tears rolling down my eyes, I remember walking down that hospital hall and I said, yes, Lord, I will. And boy, that kept me from being disillusioned. God knew what he was doing. He caught me early. And for some of us, God is saying, will you praise me? Even though it seems your world has been devastated. See, because God was not dead. Well, yeah, he died, but he was not dead finished. Jesus was not done with. And so they were disillusioned. They were disillusioned, first of all, because they had the wrong agenda. They were also disillusioned because their timing, their timing was off. They were disillusioned because they misunderstood God's plan. See, yeah, they, they did realize it correctly. He was going to redeem. He was going to set Israel free. But they misunderstood what that meant. See, freedom for them meant marching on the Roman oppressors. Freedom for them meant changing the physical government ruling order. But what Jesus said was change was really meaning is I'm changing you. But they didn't want to start there. And neither do we. We want everything else around us to change and I stay the same. God changed my neighborhood so I can be who I am in it. 
God, change my job so I can be who I am in it. Change my friends, change my family, change my wife, my husband, so I can be who I am when I'm around them. And God is like, no, I'm changing you. And if you don't want that change, you've got the wrong agenda. You're in on the wrong meeting. And so they couldn't see it. Now remember, Jesus had spoken all along and repeatedly he had said what was going to happen to him. He said it over and over, broken record. And yet they didn't catch it. They didn't see it. Because in their eyes, suffering would, could never be a part of God's plan. And today, I'll tell you right now, we have that same problem, folks. In our minds, we say, S God can't use suffering. Suffering starts happening, and we start rebuking everything, including the kitchen sink. We start rebuking everything, everybody. Might walk in your house and rebuke you. <laughs> suffering start happening, you get mad. This ain't God. Really? This can't be. God can't use this. He can't. Sorrow in my life. This is not God. It isn't. Why can't God use it? As a matter of fact, if you look at the pages of Scripture, you will see integral, the thread that runs right through the middle. Especially as you look at the New Testament, you, you will see the thread that runs through the middle of the Christian life is suffering. See, that third point of why they were disillusioned, they could not imagine a suffering Messiah. Never. Our king would never suffer because no king on earth wants to suffer. Well, he said, didn't I say I was like no other king on earth? This king suffers. They said, well, how? Why? That's not royal. We got folk across our world dying for their faith. And I wonder what someone's thinking. Wow, I what are they doing to, to suffer like that? They're living right. As a matter of fact, they're living and they won't back down. And when people give them an ultimatum, they say, go ahead with your ultimatums. I'll help you bring some more, but I'm not turning. I'm not backing down. I'm not going away. We baptized at our church in Germany, there was two, two or three years ago, we baptized a young Iranian woman and she had fled Iran after she became a Christian. She was a nurse, good professional, fled, just fled, left her family and fled because they would have killed her because she came to Christ. So she fled. And she came to that part of Germany where we were and through some friends and some other people at the church who spoke Farsi, they were able to really disciple her and help her to grow in her faith. And she had never been baptized. And so she wanted to be baptized. And, you know, after she was baptized, she said to one of the women who were helping to disciple her, I've got to go back. And people that knew her were like, what? Are you crazy? She was like, I have to go back. I've got to go back and tell my family. I've got to go back and see whom I can win. They were like, you know you can die. Yeah, I know that. But i got to go back. See, God doesn't erase suffering just because you came to Christ. God doesn't erase hard times because you came to Christ. As a matter of fact, sometimes we make some bad decisions and we think coming to Christ is going to erase the consequences. Sometimes God doesn't erase those consequences. Sometimes he does. But what he does is that he uses that to shape and to change us. How many people have you heard it said, boy, I grew the most in my life. I grew the most when, when, when nothing bad, when everything went right for me. That's when I grew the most. I know I haven't. Can I tell you when I grew the most? Boy, when life was tough. When God had me on my knees. When I realized that all that I thought was something wasn't really anything. Sometimes God will use our pain in that journey to help us to realize we had the wrong agenda. We were focused on ourselves and we need to die to ourselves. And that's what he does in suffering. And so they couldn't receive a Messiah who suffered. As a matter of fact, as he walked up. 
they were prevented from recognizing him. I've heard all kinds of stories. Maybe God just didn't want them to see him. Part of it was they could not believe it was him because no one back then and now, no one expected a resurrection, even though he told them no one expected a resurrection. And so they saw Jesus walking. That can't be Jesus. John did do dead. And people still do that today. Oh, my resurrection. Man, that's you believe that? What are you, crazy? That's what they'll tell you. What are you, nuts? There's no such thing as a resurrection. And you say that because you're the expert on the dead and the living. Because that's how people talk, as if they're experts on it. But the point is, no one expected it, and so no one believed it, and so they would not believe it. And it says, he walks up and walks among them as they are debating. But I want you to see the sadness first of this. Read that in that verse. And then they said, but we had hoped that he would redeem Israel. When they walked up, and Jesus said, what are you talking about? And they said, did you live under the biggest rock in Jerusalem that you don't know what was going on? What? What was going on? And do you see the irony in this? They're asking him if he doesn't know what's going on, and he's the one that the going on was about. <laughs> they were standing there looking at him, asking him, you don't know what's happening? I am what's happening. But they couldn't see it. That account always blows my mind. Because here these guys were, they thought they had it together. They thought their plan was worked out. And they were headed back home sad, discouraged, disillusioned. When they had come for the Passover and had come to see glory be revealed. But they missed it. That glory came through death. That glory came through suffering. That glory came through pain. We had hoped he would redeem Israel. And then Jesus starts to help him out. I love how Jesus does that. But you know what? Sometimes in him helping us out, he does have to rebuke us. And that rebuke was hard, but it was, it was good. It was loving. He says, oh, you foolish and slow of heart to believe, in essence, what you have had all along. These are the scriptures they had all along. And sometimes we have the word of God in different versions sitting in our house. And Christ could say to some of us, oh, you who are foolish and slow to believe what's in your house, in your car, on your iPad, on your computer. What is that? God's word. Oh, you who are slow to believe what has been spoken. And so you hear why they were, you hear why they were disillusioned, but you also hear why we were. I want to ask you this. I'll ask you a question. How many of us have stepped back and away from God because of either the suffering that we have been experiencing or in, in our life or the suffering that we have seen displayed in the lives of others and in communities. How many of us have taken a step back and said, God, I don't understand this. I don't know what you're doing. How can, how can you let this go on? Who are, what, 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 what are you doing? What's happening, God? And you've backed away from intimacy with him. And you've started to let discouragement set in. God, this, was not I signed, this wasn't what I signed up for. How could God let that happen? How could Jesus do that to us? That's the question. But then I want to show you just for a moment, when you see the hope in his rebuke, you see how it was turned into delight. Can you see it begin to happen? How did it turn into delight? It's because he first had to point them somewhere. He said, see, see, see your problem is you've abandoned the word. See, you've You've started to believe all that you've heard. I don't know if, 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 if those two had that thought about redeeming Israel on their own or if they heard it from the community. I don't know where they heard it from first. But it was a part of their life. They've adopted that way of thinking. And Jesus said, you are slow to believe what's been spoken by the prophets. 
And I would say to some of us today, you are probably discouraged and maybe even disillusioned because you are slow to believe what God has said in his word about who he is, about how he works, and about what he'll do. God uses difficult times as the core of developing you and I in our faith. Suffering is as much a part of the Christian life as prayer is. Because when we suffer, we are free from, so if, 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 if we are people that want to follow after Christ, when we start to suffer, we realize that this world is evil and sinful. We realize that this world is temporary. We realize that men and women will fail us. And so we don't put our trust in any of those things. We turn to God and say, God, you and you alone. Like the disciples said when everybody started walking away, you going to go to? Where are we going to go? Is there some other place where we can get the words of eternal life? He said, where are we going to go? And for some of us today, God's going, you going to leave too? Are you going to walk away? And God wants you to answer and say, where are we going to go, Lord? No one else has these words that you do. No one else can change my life like you. No one else has changed my life. No one else sets me with hope for the future like you do. No one gives me words that I can bank on and I can depend on like you do. No one. So where am I going to go? Help me understand. And then he says he took them from Moses on down. He showed them God's plan. But what it says, I like it. He shows them how his Christ must suffer and then reach his glory. Because their sticking point, where they stumbled, where they tripped, was in this Christ suffering. So he went to where their problem was and he showed them in the word how it dealt with their problem. So how are you and I going to turn from disillusionment to the light? It ain't going to be by telling you, hey, it's all going to be all right. You're going to get yours one day. Just don't worry about it. It's all set up for you. Everything is about you. Always was and always will be. Because God wants you happy. Because it's you. That's all it's about. No. You, you realize what Jesus did. He went through scripture and pointed to himself. And whenever Jesus becomes the focus... The focus gets off of you, which is usually why you all discouraged, because you have too much focus on you. Too much. I know I do. When I'm all absorbed in myself, boy, that's a messy place to be. Because I want the world to revolve around me. I want my job to work for me. I want my family to work for me. I want every me, me, me. But when I get my eyes on Jesus, man, and he begins to show me God's plan. Why were they, why were they disillusioned, turned to delight? Think about it for this. Why was it turned to delight? First thing, God showed them his plan. I love this. He said all, Jesus later said all authority was given unto me. But what God showed them is I have always been in control. He showed them from beginning to end how it was pointing to Christ. He showed them that through the ages, although man would act a fool, God's plan would still be in effect. God never for a moment lost control. And they know Israel's history. And he tells you and I, I've never lost. I know where you are. I know what you're doing. I know how you got to that mess you're in right now. I know it. He says, but guess what? I am working it in my plan because I'm getting you somewhere. I'm getting you to the point where you see that it's not about you, it's about me. I'm getting you to the point where you will die to your own agenda and you will begin to adopt mine and begin to live like I want you to. But the only place you'll find that is in the word. He took them to the scriptures. And if Jesus takes us to the scriptures, don't you think we need to go to the scriptures? So he takes them to the scriptures 
And later on, we learn that while they were hearing it, that their hearts burned. What does that burn mean? That their hearts were ignited. Faith was ignited in their life. Passion for living for God was ignited as he shared scripture. And some of you in here today, God is igniting your hearts right now because you are hearing his word. Not because of me. It's because you are hearing his word. You are hearing what God's plan is. You are hearing that he and he alone is in control and he and he alone is your focus. And it's only his agenda that will bring you what you really, really seek. And so it was turned to delight because they realized God's plan. It turned to delight because they realized he was in control all the time. And some of us, I don't think we believe it. I think we believe like David, they did when they said the chief priests and our rulers handed him over. No, they didn't hand him over. He went. He went willingly. Understand, Jesus was always in control. He had to remind Pilate. When Pilate said, don't you know I have the power? You have no power except that which was given you. That's what he told Pilate. He looked him right in the eye after he was beaten to a pulp. Turns to Pilate and says, you have nothing that God didn't give you. And God says to you and I today, the Jesus that you believe in better be the one that is sovereign Better be the one whose agenda is the one that is being followed and the one who has all authority and all power. If you're following a Jesus other than that, you might have the wrong Jesus, which is why you might be discouraged. And so he sits up here and he says, look, guys. And so they were just like, wow. And I love what Jesus does. Just as they're getting into the heart of the discussion, their stop comes. Come on. You ever had that happen? You're on the bus of the train, and you're in a great discussion, and you get ready to get to the meat of it. Oh, man, I got to get off. Here's my stop. And Jesus starts walking. Say, whoa, 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 whoa. Where you going? Where you going? No, 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 no. We want to hear more. Remember now, they were just arguing and debating at the beginning of the journey. They were sad and disillusioned. All of a sudden, hope was starting to rise, and they were like, no, 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 you can't go. Ho, ho. Tell you what. Where you going? You don't have any place to stay, do you? No. Why don't you come stay with us? All of a sudden, they went to being sad and despondent. And they were like, hold on a second. I don't know who you are, but you need to come with us. Because what you are saying is burning in our hearts. What you are saying is igniting something that we want ignited. And God is saying, that's where I want you. I want you to the point where passion where faith where trust and belief is ignited and you go god i want more but guess what they wanted more of him they didn't want more stuff oh god so is this now where i pray for my new house god they wanted him come and stay with us because it is getting it's it's late the evening is coming Come and sit down and have a meal. And you know in that culture, meals is where fellowship and things happen. Meals. I know we miss it today because we got fast food. You know, this week we were all choosing our different places where we would go. Because we don't get, okay, we get McDonald's and Burger King. That's it. Okay, no, no, I'm sorry. Subway. If you want to spend $15 for a sandwich. Seriously. Seriously. And so McDonald's and Subway. So guess where we did not go this week? McDonald's and Burger King. And Subway. Because <laughs> our kids are like, we get that all the time. We don't, we don't want that. And so we were choosing, what do we have today? And so today it was, okay, so we did Chipotle one day, and we did something else, and we did something else. Because for us, it is not what we've ever had. And so what we see here for him, he said, Jesus says, look, you want more? I got more. And it's in fellowship. It's in coming closer. They were walking on the road. Now they're in, now he's in their house. They were on the road. And now he's in their house. It went from a conversation to now fellowship. And that's where God wants you and I. So you will turn that disillusionment to delight when you want intimacy. They, did, they didn't just want words. Those words were igniting something. And they wanted this man, whom they still didn't recognize to be Christ, 
to be in their house because of what he was saying. So they sit down, and I love when they recognize him. When, when, when Jesus did what he normally does when you're in smaller settings, he got comfortable. He started to break the bread. He started to get into fellowship to understand that Middle Eastern culture too. He started to sit around and comfortably as they reclined and they were relaxed. And now Jesus was even more informal with them. Some of us think this is all you can get about Jesus is sitting in this place like this. If this is all to your Christianity, you are missing most of it. You are. If this is all that your Christianity is about, is coming here on Sunday morning, you are missing the other six days of close intimacy with the Lord that could be happening in your life. And so he says, and he, he doesn't say anything. He breaks the bread, he blesses it, and he gives it to him. And as he does it, they go, ho, 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 hold on a second. <laughs> There's only one person that does this like this. They're like, Jesus. It's just, he's been, boom, gone. Gone. Because what was Jesus' point? His point was to get them from focusing on themselves and their plan to recognizing him and God's plan. And he got them there. Mission accomplished, done. You don't need to see me physically now. Your heart is burning so much with faith and with passion, you don't need to see me physically. You know I'm there. Now you know. And I love this. They walk seven miles. Okay, when was the last time you biked seven miles? Some of you here, I know you do that. I'm not one of them. But when was the last time you walked? I know we drive seven miles. That's easy. But when was the last time you walked seven miles or ran seven miles? These two were like, remember, the evening was coming as late. They're like, oh, no, we've got to go back and tell some folk. So they went back seven miles, because that's how long it took, to tell folk, we just saw Jesus. This thing is real, y'all. God is alive. Look, Jesus is alive, which means his plan, and we heard it. He shared us you know, he shared with us the plan. He told us what to focus on. He ignited our hearts with passion. But they got back and thought they were going to be the highlight of the evening news. They did. They got back and folk were talking about Jesus is alive. What? Wait a minute. You too? Yes. I love that. Because now they said, oh, he's been visiting you too? And then they said, S Simon too? Wow, man, this dude is, whoa, well, he did vanish, so he must be able to pop up anywhere he wants. And understand what he did. He was igniting hope, boom, passion, and he was creating eyewitness accounts all over the place that could not be disputed. This thing is real. And you know what? That's not just for 2,000 years ago. Today, God is igniting hope. You don't need to see him physically. You already heard the eyewitness testimony. You already know that. Y'all believe in George Washington. Y'all ain't see him. <laughs> we got a picture of him on our bill, but not no one in this room has seen him. Not one. But we quote him in our history. You don't need to see him. You read what he did. Eyewitness accounts, people who had been around him, same thing. And so now what happens? Jesus said, here I am, y'all. And then he sends him out later because he says, all power and authority has been given to me. Now go. And when disillusionment starts to set in, God says, remember, you're probably on your own agenda. You probably think I'm not in control. You're still focused on you and who it's about instead of letting the focus be on me and you die into yourself. You want to stay delightful? You want to stay encouraged? Let Jesus be the focus. His agenda be yours. And understand that his power is real.